this is the way I look now. <laughs> you look closely, my hair has undergone a transition. It's about 3x smaller also. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure after the next decade, I will catch up and surpass Moore's Law with uh, the amount of hair, but right now it's just 3x lower. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about first is just the difference is for Mark. Sure. You apply 3D to wear a wig. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I'm wearing one now. Um, so what I'm going to talk about first is I'm going to talk about the way things were in device engineering for process development when I joined and the way things are now. You can imagine uh, the differences. So here's a picture of the, the kinds of technologies we were working on, planar technologies, and to meet the performance targets of the technology, we didn't have that many knobs to play with. So as a TCAT engineer, you'd spend a lot of time simulating uh, the new species of dopants, uh, simulating implants, energies, vinyls, and also uh, some of the uh, dimensions that have to do with the spacers, so you could, you could put those uh, implants where, where you wanted to, all with the um, goal of trying to make sharper um, sharper doping profile so you can control the electrostatics better. That's generally what we did for a number of years uh, in the TCAD department. Of course, we, worked, we supported tools doing the same kind of thing. So things have changed quite a bit. 2013, we now have a uh, FinFact technology. If you look at this, um, this is the gate going this direction. These are the fins going the other direction, so look at fins. But we have a lot more uh, knobs that we can now fiddle with in order to meet technology targets. Uh, so, of course, everyone has heard about strain. We heard a lot about it earlier uh, earlier in this um, conference. We have a high-K insulator. There's metal gates where we, where we adjusted the work functions. And, of course, we have the 3D architecture that we can play with the ge geometries involved with that, along with dopings and, and anneals and all the, uh, the usual stuff. So, overall, I would say that, you know, as a TCAD person, I think our job has become more complex. But at the same time, I think there's just a lot more opportunity here to, uh, you know, a lot more rocks to look under in order to gain the kind of performance that we need to meet the targets. So this is device engineering for process development. Uh, another big role that TCAT has is we also help in looking at the next generation or future generations of devices, strategic device options, and helping uh, to vet those. Now, when I joined, we actually had a fairly limited horizon in terms of the, 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 uh, the devices that we were considering. And one of, this, one of the reasons was we were in the midst of just an arch scaling. So we really didn't have to look too far ahead. And so really the two options that we were considering at the time uh, in terms of strategic device options were, was SOI and Trigate. Now things have changed quite a bit. In 2013, we actually looked much further ahead. Uh, there are many more options now that are on the table. For instance, nanowires, V5s, TFETs, further out spin, nano relays, relays and, and graphene devices. And we, we, do, we not only do real simulation work here, we also do, um, Intel does uh, a lot of experimental work on these devices. So there, 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 there's real effort that's going on. This, is, this has been a big change. Now in order for TCAT to be able to, to handle the, the new uh, panoply of devices, uh, we've had to make changes to our tool set. So if we look at what the toolbox looked like back in 1994, um, what I'm going to sh uh, show you uh, plotted against is, is really the, the resolution of, of the tool. So whether it's on the, more on the device level or all the way down to anatomistic level, and then the physics involved, uh, which is compact modeling, if you're talking about just device level uh, uh, behavior, all the way down to uh, ab initio uh, physics. If you, if you take a look at what we were using when I joined, on the device side, we basically had one tool. That was Pisces, product from Stanford. And on the Pisces side, we had also one tool, which was uh, Supreme. And the, both of these are continuum tools. These are, these are classical tools, classical, classical uh, device and process physics. So the toolbox has changed quite a bit in 20 years. If you look at it, <laughs> what it's like now, I mean, we still have our diffusion simulator. Uh, it's now a, uh, our own proprietary uh, simulation framework called MDS, Modular Device Simulator. And we have we now use flutes in terms of process, uh, in terms of classical process simulation. 
Uh, so that's replaced Supreme. And this is from uh, originally from uh, Florida, and we've uh, we have again we have a proprietary version of that that, that we've we've uh, modified. But if you look on the device side, we've really expanded the hierarchy. Uh, for the last 10 to 15 years, we, we make our own compact models. And I'll talk a little bit why we do that a little bit later in the talk. Uh, but we also have a Monte Carlo simulator, which is more of the semi-classical regime. Uh, we have a Schroeder Poisson solver. Um, we have a, a, we routinely run a non-equilibrium screen function. Uh, approach, uh, and the product we use there is, is, is Nemo, it, 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 this comes out of Purdue. On the process side, we've also extended the hierarchy uh, for, in terms of uh, semi-classical implant simulation. We use a Monte Carlo uh, tool uh, called Tomcat. We run molecular dynamic simulations, and we also actually routinely run density functional theories uh, simulator VAST. So along with using different tools, and, and, and more, also, the range of the problems that we address has expanded. So what I'm showing here are various physical systems that have their approximate number of atoms involved. These are just that, the atoms involved in the 2D cross-section of these systems. So traditional TCAD, when I joined, uh, uh, where it really lies is simulating the active area of the device. And that's pretty much most of what our simulations uh, address. And as you would expect, as Moore's law has pushed us down into the nanoscale reg regime, well, naturally, now in 2013, we simulate uh, structures that require a lot more um, atomistic resolution. For instance, leakage across a few model layers of, uh, of dielectric uh, for our for our gates, and also the effects of de uh, defects and, and random dopant fluctuations, which are really it can be single atom uh, uh, kinds of uh, phenomena. We need to be able to simulate uh, this kind of thing. Now, this isn't too surprising that we pushed smaller. But we've also had to push larger, too. TCAT is now asked to simulate circuits more. And the reason is that when you are in, uh, trying to vet a strategic device option, a, a transistor replacement, it's no longer sufficient to just evaluate it from its intrinsic device performance. You really need to know how it, rea uh, how it behaves in a circuit. And the way that we do this is we develop a, our own customized um, compact models that, that uh, encapsulate that behavior. Also, as the device um, dimensions get smaller, the uh, structures that are nearby the device have much more of an effect on the overall device performance. So these parasitic structures become very important. So you end up having to actually simulate more than the active device uh, than you did uh, in 1994 when the device was big and those parasitics were really afterthoughts. So that's the introduction. What I'm going to talk about next, I'm going to describe the three trends that I've seen really in the past five years. The first one is the rise of atomistic simulation techniques. So if we, as we push into the nanoscale regime, obviously quantum physics has become a lot more important uh, in determining our overall device behavior. But also, to solve technology problems, we, we, we often have to look for designer materials. And both those kinds of situations re require new tools, tools that, that have atomistic resolution. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, the next trend is capturing uh, imperfection. So it used to be that <clears throat> simulating defects and variations were really an afterthought. But now we actually design devices and we vet devices, strategic device options, with <coughs> defect and with their vulnerability to defects and variation in mind. So you need to be able to capture this with your simulation methodologies, and I'll, I'll discuss that uh, briefly. <coughs> and finally, I want to talk about bridging the gaps. This is something that we're very interested in uh, at Intel, and I, I don't think there's as much interest anymore uh, in the outside world. And so what this is, is we are trying to bridge the gap between atomistic simulations techniques and continuum simulation techniques, the classical drift diffusion process simulation techniques. And the reason is, uh, actually I'm gonna get, I'm, I'll hold off on the, on the bottom line reason why we need to do this, but the, the, the result is that we still need to use these classical models to do our, our, our development. And so it's very important for us to renovate these models in order to make them applicable to this new nanoscale uh, uh, era. So, First one I'm going to talk about is rise in atomistic simulations. 
So why do we need animistic simulate, simulation techniques like, like, for instance, like DFT and, and, and EGM? Well, the first reason is, I'm going to be dramatic here, is that the train has left Newton Station. <laughs> so the train I'm talking about is technology. So now that we're pushing in to uh, you know, the 10 nanometer range, you know, classical physics really, I mean, it still applies. Electrostatics is still very important, but it's not enough. We are actually pushing into the realm where the wave nature of electrons affects all the device behavior. And we're, we're, we're designing devices, of course, to mitigate it, but we're also designing devices to exploit this behavior. So I'm going to talk about both of those. And the second reason is that when it comes to material properties, size does matter. So I'm showing uh, an exaggeration here. You have a big lump of graphite over here, and then you have a sheet of graphene here. And of course, the, the, uh, these two systems have very different transport properties. So as you get pushed down below 10 nanometers, you can no longer rely on the bulk material parameters when you're doing your simulations. You actually have to compute the uh, material properties for the specific system that you're simulating. And to do this, you, it requires animistic tools. There's really no other, uh, other way about it. So the first example I'm going to give from, from some work that's done at Intel uh, would be some of the work we did looking at trying to control leakage in an indium arsenide um, high electron mobility transistor. So for motivation, this is a plot from Del Alamo. What it shows is the on current <coughs> versus gate length for, several, for transistors made of several different material systems, all with the same IR. What you can see is that silicon is, is slowly but surely, amazingly, still increasing its performance as we go to a smaller gate length. But there are other material systems out there that actually give you a lot more on current. And so why is that? Well, uh, the big reason for, for uh, a material system like indium arsenide is that it has a smaller effective mass. So carriers are going to be accelerated more efficiently uh, to higher velocities from an electric field uh, than, than they would in silicon. And that it manifests itself in several ways. If you measure the mobility, it's, it's much higher. Uh, the injection velocity, if you extract that, it's higher. But it also has actually a, a, a big negative. This particular material system also has a, a small band gap. And that can lead to a lot more leakage in the off state. So the question that you, we want to answer here, and I'm not going to answer it definitively, but I, I'll, I'll show you some work we've done in this area, is really what happens to the indium arsenide down here? So the way we're going to tackle this problem is going to use a technique called non-equilibrium screen function technique. Um, it's essentially solving Schrodinger's equation, but it's a, it's a special version of Schrodinger's equation that's been um, formulated to, for electronic transport, and you solve it using Green's functions. The input to this is the, the actual uh, 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 atomic uh, positions of, of the atoms that, that, that make up your, your device and also the atomic basis functions of the underlying uh, lattice atoms. That's in the um, tight binding formu formulation. So the tight binding formulation, you use the atomic orbitals of the underlying uh, lattice atoms. In general, the more orbitals that you add, the more um, accurate your representation for, of the wave function becomes. Now, there's another version that's also very popular, and, and we will also uh, investigate how, how applicable it is, which is to, instead of using the atomic orbitals, is to basically use an effective mass representation. That isn't as accurate, but it's, it's a lot more computationally efficient. And I'll, I'll make a couple comments on that, at least for, for this particular um, application. So uh, a good example of a code that uses this technique is Nemo, and it was developed at Purdue. So this is the simulation that we're doing. I want to credit Saeed Hassan for, for the actual work here. So we're looking at, essentially, an indium arsenide fin, uh, fin pet. And there's a gate around it, but we're not going to simulate this whole 3D structure. We're just going to simulate, actually, a slice through the structure. So if you were to look at it from the top, uh, you can see there's a gate on one side, there's the fin in the middle, and then there's a gate on the other side. So it looks like the classic double gate uh, structure, which is what we're going to simulate. Um, the gate lengths that we're looking at are between 10 and 20 nanometers, and the, the width of the fan is 5 nanometers. And, uh, as I told you, we're going to use an NEGF approach. In this case, we're actually using OMEN. Um, and we're looking at using a bulk type binding representation for the electronic wave function and also a effective mass representation. 
So this is the overall result when we're looking at that particular device at 20 nanometers and at 10 nanometers. So there's a couple things that you can note here. But the big one, the big problem that you see is that normally when you're targeting technology, you really want your off current, which is where these IV characteristics um, intersect the VG equals zero point, you really want it down here, close to one nanoamp per micron. And you can see that neither of these devices are really anywhere close to that. And the big reason... Where would the data be for this, uh, the actual device? Uh, so I'm not, actually, I'm not showing any data here. So I just asked yeah. where would it be? Yes. Actually, Suman, can you answer? Would you know off the top of your head where the data would be for, for this? It, 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 this is about as small as they would. I don't, they did not go down to 10 nanometers. Uh, you know, they would, it looks like they went about 30 nanometers here. They were at 100 nanoamps and about, uh, so, so, so 10 to the minus 7 is, is, is where they were, but at a larger device size. What, what, this is room temperature. Uh, I room believe that, sir. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, but the footprint of the devices are very big, so there are more nuances for this thing. You know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I might talk a little bit about this. Yeah. Actually, I'm sure we're going to have overlap quite a bit. You'll, I'm actually showing you kind of the, the uh, more idealistic uh, uh, story here. I think you'll, you'll, you'll hear the dirty details. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I guess one, but I guess one question is, is if you have to roll like a tool, is that a trivial solution? I mean, if you're running for it. Well, that's not a trivial solution for products. No. Well, the product, yeah. Yeah. It depends what kind of product it is. But it's, yeah. Well, if, products that you want to sell billions of. No, it's, 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 yeah. But for a server or for some server mm -hmm. farm. Yeah. It, I, I would suppose that's a possibility, but but again, you know, they're making servers out of cheaper parts all the time. So you know, it, it you know really does as, as, as Shua was saying. It really, you know, it comes down so much to cost. What are customers willing to pay for? And they, a lot of them, you know, really the the, the answer is you know you're going to get a lot more value at this point out of the silicon out of the silicon part that runs a little slower than you are, you know trying to do something fancy and, and fit, uh, you know, some of the technical problems of, of this indium arsenide device. But it's a little too early to, 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 to uh, you know, uh, close the book on this. But let me just talk a little bit about what is driving the, the higher off current. Well, it's, it's, it's really source to drain tunneling. So you're actually having, you know, in a, in a typical MOSFET, what you want, you want this barrier to control the leakage. These devices are small enough that the barrier no longer is controlling the leakage because the, the uh, carriers can tunnel right through. You see this little uptick here. So what happens, and this is in the 20 uh, uh, nanometer device, what's happening in this case is you're actually having band-to-band -band leakage. So at a lower gate bias, this um, uh, what, what, what you're seeing is the barrier actually gets a little bit larger, but now there is a, a, a different leakage path. You can actually tunnel them from conduction band to valence band back into the conduction band. This is also occurring at the 10 nanometer device, but it's really swamped out by source, source, drain, source to drain leakage. So what is the drain bus here? I, I think it's the usual 50 millivolts. For direct band to that? No. Well, at the, for a linear current, current well, that's generally like half a volt or something, right? Pardon? Half a volt probably, VDS, to get this band to that interval. Is that true? Why would it have to be? No, no. Why would it have to be? This is double anyway. Oh, you're we're just pulling up the. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. You're making me worry. See, <laughs> Suma may know more about these simulations than I do. But <laughs> <laughs> you're getting a milliamp of current, yeah. so it's a, it must be a Well, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that's one of the reasons why we're not plotting any experimental data on this. Right? <laughs> Okay, so you know, it, again, I, I, I want to, you know, before I, I torpedo this whole, whole uh, 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 application, what we're looking for here is, you know, what are, you know, what are the big concerns? When we go to a technology like this, what do we have to be concerned about? What is going to limit the scaling of a technology? You know, for, for any, any non-silicon technology that you consider, it has to be of a scale. It's not going to be enough to be a one-generation wonder. So those are just the kinds of things that we're looking at. Um, so the, the, the obvious ways, if you're a, a device uh, engineer, to try to solve a problem like this is you actually 
you just make the fin thinner. When you make the fin thinner, what happens is you're actually putting the gate in closer proximity to the atoms in the center of the channel. What that does for you is it gives you better electrostatic control. If you look back on this diagram, I don't really show a, a result of this, but you're actually going to sharpen up these corners here and, and make the barrier a little bit larger. And that will suppress leakage. You can do the same kind of thing by going to a nano a, a nanowire um, uh, geometry. In this case, we're actually not thinning this region. Uh, we're going to actually keep it at, at about five nanometers, but we're putting gate all around the channel, and it, it, it accomplishes the same thing. You're putting more gate closer to the center of the channel, so you can control the potential better there. So, if you look at the results here, uh, you can see a couple things. So, the results for just thinning the fin fat are in green. And what you can see is we're actually able now to, to successfully suppress the um, off current. The same is true uh, when, uh, when, when we go to a nanowire. When we go to a nanowire, again, we're, we're able to suppress the off current. However, we're still not able to, even after you know, doing you know, tricks like, the, like uh, playing with a work function, we really cannot uh, still get the kind of uh, off current that we need for the, the 10 nanometer device. So this is an example of the, the kinds of simulations that we would do when we're, when we're evaluating a new technology. The other thing that we wanted to look at for this particular simulation is can we get away with a cheaper simulation technique? Instead of using a tight binding approach, can we use an effective mass approach? And so what we're showing here in blue is the same simulations for 20 nanometer device, 10 nanometer device with effective mass. And you see that you don't, you don't capture all the uh, source to drain leakage. Or, and you don't even capture the band-to-band -band leakage. So effective mass for these scale devices really isn't sufficient. Okay, so this was an example of where we're trying to mitigate quantum effects. I want to show you another example where we're actually trying to exploit quantum effects. And Suman, I, I, I'll suppose that you're, you're going to talk a lot about TPET. Um, but I'm going to give you the kind of the, the one-minute overview of how the TPET operates. So here's our conventional MOSFET. Um, and the professor wants to uh, cover this, but I'm, I'm going to cover it again. So in the off state, what you're counting on to prevent leakage is this large barrier between the source and the drain. So the carriers are, are trapped over there. They, they can't make it through. In the on state, you pull down that barrier and current flows. So that's the standard MOSFET. In a tunnel fat or T-fat, you actually replace um, the N plus region with a P plus region. And now you're actually looking at the, 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 the carriers that, uh, that you're interested in for transport reside in the valence band. So there's a big gap here. At uh, zero gate bias, you expect nothing to happen. However, when you uh, apply a bias, what, what you end up doing is really thinning this for forbidden gap between the source and, the, uh, and underneath the gate. And this actually allows carriers to quantum mechanically tunnel through, and now your current is being carried by uh, tunneling carriers, not by carriers that are surmounting the barrier. So that's the, that's the key to the, the tunnel effect. Uh, you know, hence the name. Now if you look at, if you compare the IV characteristics of both these devices, at least ideally, it's going to look something like this. So what I'm showing is again the drain current versus gate bias. This is kind of the ideal characteristic. Um, if you were, you know, ideally what you'd like from a digital switch, certainly not for analog, uh, uh, analog application, you want zero, on uh, zero off current uh, below the threshold voltage, and then uh, you would like the full uh, on current once you, uh, once you uh, adjust the gate to the threshold voltage. So the standard MOSFET looks something like this. Uh, this slope, which is very important for switching and low power performance, is thermodynamic, thermodynamically limited to 60 millivolts per decade uh, in, a, in a MOSFET. The tunnel FET doesn't have this kind of limitation. You can actually get a sharper uh, turn on characteristic and more current at lower BT, and what that gives you is better switching and better low power performance. All right, these are the advantages of the tunnel FET. But actually, what I'm going to talk about now is 
um, a, a, an application where we're trying to address one of the big disadvantages of the tunnel FET, at least the 3.5 tunnel FETs, which is this, that the P-type performance is just sad. So if you look at uh, an indium arsenide tunnel FET, you compare N-type to P-type, you can see the N-type has that nice sharp turn on, a, a good low power performance, uh, but you don't see that with the P-type. And why is that? Well, this, this is, I'm going to show you a simplistic but, but accurate region. So if you look at the, the P-type, when the P-type tunnel fed, you actually have an N-plus region here. And so there are really two components to the current. You're going to, ha uh, you're going to have the number of electrons that are in the conduction band, and you're going to have their ability to tunnel into the valence band. And you can, think, you can reverse this picture if you think about holes tunneling, but I'm going to just stick with electrons right now. So for 3.5 devices, this tunneling probability is, is quite good. However, the number of carriers in the conduction band, because of the low density of states in the conduction band, is not very good in, in 3.5 devices. <coughs> so you don't get the kind of current that you, you would like. Now, if you look at a column 4 material like uh, silicon or germanium, the number of carriers in the conduction band is good because the uh, Column 4 uh, materials have a good density of states in the conduction band. However, their tunneling probability is low. And to understand this, I think, uh, you know, if you, for those that are not in electrical solid state engineering, uh, the reason that occurs is the fact that in 3-5 devices, you have what's called a, a, a direct band, uh, band gap. In column 4 materials, you do not. So what does this mean? If you look at the band gap in EK space, energy momentum space, so this is what I've been showing you is, the, is energy band diagrams in energy uh, real space. But this is the norm, normal way that we like to look at band diagrams. The band gap is, is the distance between the lowest part of the conduction band and the highest part of the valence band and the three fives that occurs at the same point. So when carriers are tunneling from conduction to valence band or vice versa, at most they just have to change their energy. And that actually leads to a high tunneling current. In a column 4 material, the lowest part of the conduction band and highest part of the valence band occurs not at the gamma point. And so what happens is if you have tunneling from conduction band to valence band, not only do you uh, have to change energy, but you also have to absorb a phonon. It's a two-step process and this ends up giving you lower tunneling current. So that's, so the bottom line here is neither material system is giving us what, it, what we want. We like to make a complementary technology. Uh, so that means we want good uh, comparable PFET uh, and NFET performance. In order to do that, we have to have a good density of states in both the conduction and, and the valence band, but we don't get that from three fives. Um, unfortunately, we don't get good tunneling probability when we use uh, column 4 materials. So we're kind of stuck. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to actually find a new material or make a new material. So how do you do that? So this is the way that we went about doing that. So we started out with, we, we started out with germanium and silicon. Uh, silicon, and we, we added some alloys in there. We also included strain and orientation in the kinds of things that we're going to modif uh, modify. What strain does is it changes the uh, position of the atoms. When you change the position of the atoms in relation to each other, you're going to change the band structure. The same is true uh, when you consider orientation. Orientation uh, affects, uh, affects transport in that carriers see a different atomic arrangement as they're traveling in real space. That means that they're actually traveling in a different place in EK space, and you can, you can try to pick an orientation that will also give you those two uh, characteristics that you want. High, uh, conduction band density of states, and good tunneling probability. So the way that we looked at this, so, 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 so we're going to run an experiment, a numerical experiment. We're going to use these as the variables that we change, then what we're going to use is the non-local pseudo-potential technique to compute the band structure, and we're just going to keep on changing some of these values until we get the band structure that we want. Once we determine the band structure that we want, uh, due to a small limitation with, with Nemo, we actually need to fit it with type binding parameters so we can, we can run it. Uh, this is an extra step that it's some future state we, we, we may not need to do. 
Uh, so we're going to fit this band structure, basically be able to replace the same band structure with type binding. Then we can actually go and use Nemo again and run the uh, uh, what we're interested in, the, the device that we're interested in, with the right uh, uh, with the right material, and look at the ID characteristic. So that's what we ended up doing. And so what I'm showing, oh, uh, actually I want to I want to digress for a second. I actually want to talk a little bit about this process here when we're trying to when we're trying to uh, find the right band structure. So the way we in, it, it ended up, the, the way it all came down, is that we ended up with germanium. We started with germanium, and what we're going to use is we're going to use strain. Again, we're going to modulate strain to try to change this from an indirect semiconductor to a direct semiconductor. So what we need to have happen is we need the band gap in the gamma point to, to uh, be smaller than the band gap in the L valley. So... We did that by modulating it with stress, and, and let me just explain what I'm show, showing here. It's, I'm showing here, again, in blue, this is the band gap in the L valley. The red curves are the band gap in the uh, gamma valley for two different kinds of uh, strain that we're applying. And so we're looking for the condition where the red valley actually becomes smaller than the L valley. And if you look at it, and we're doing it by applying two different kinds of stress. One kind of stress, which is tensile stress, where we're pulling the atoms a little bit further apart in the lattice. And the other kind, kind of stress is compressive stress, where we're pushing the atoms a little bit closer together. And it turns out that we're actually able to find an indirect, a, a, the indirect to direct transition at about uh, 2,500 megapascals on the germanium. Okay, that's, that's quite a healthy uh, bit of, uh, of stress. The other thing that we decided to do, though, then is to actually look at, uh, investigate some alloys. And one alloy that we found that really helped was to, to, to add tin. And so it turns out that here's our result from uh, that I was just showing you with zero tin content. We needed about 2,500 megapascals in order to get the the uh, indirect to direct transition. Well, if we added 8% tin, we don't actually have to add any stress. So this is what we ended up. Uh, doing. This is the material system uh, that we chose and we went and, and simulated uh, the IB characteristics and we're going to compare them for N-type and P-type TFETs to those of a gallium antimonide and an indium arsenide uh, TFET system. And if you magnify up here, uh, you see that we achieved at least part of what we wanted. So if you look at the indium arsenide system, you see that the N-type TFET and the P-type TFET are, are, uh, have quite a bit of gap, so it would be, makes it more difficult to, have a, uh, to construct a complementary technology out of this. The uh, gallium antimonide TFET, pretty much the same thing. But if you look at the germanium-10 TFET, we got a lot better, uh, more complementary performance. Now, I won't go into the details, but obviously if you're now using the gamma point for your, uh, for your uh, uh, for your tunneling, uh, you're going to you're going to end up having a lot of the similar problems as a three five device. Yeah, but so yeah. Okay, but the, the advantage that you get here is, and this was kind of un, uh, you know, I, I would have anticipated this, is that you get you're still getting much better performance at a at a lower at the lower gate biases. So the gallium, uh, excuse me, the, the, the germanium tin TFET actually looks like it would be pretty healthy if you're going to a very low technology, uh, very low power supply technology. Could I ask you a question? You can ask me a question. I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it. So <laughs> if, you, if you change the band structure like this, and even if it becomes direct band gap, mm -hmm. it's not clear that the, at the gamma point, mm -hmm. the functions will actually interact well, meaning direct band gap already does not mean that the biggest tunneling component will happen at the gamma. The wave function overlap will have to work out between the conduction band and the balance band wave function. We measure it band wrapping, that's what it's talking about. Yeah, so you're saying that I won't know, I won't get that naturally out of NGF if I run that? Yes, because it very much depends on how you are fitting your type binding band. Yeah, that. Because that, yeah. that, that fit. You know, that's fair. Yeah, that, I think that's a fair comment. It's certainly yeah. do without yeah. electron volts. 
See, that's why we need Hong Go's work. <laughs> so we can skip that whole part where we need to kind of, kind of fake out the high binding. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, that, that, that is definitely the weakest point. Point of this. I mean, here we we, we got a nice uh, you know pseudo potential band structure, and now we're 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 kind of having to fake it out and make it tight binding to run these simulations. Well, That's fair. Data, they, they don't real. Look, I'll, I'll I'll come clean right now. I'm going to show you very little data. <laughs> I'm, what, I, what I'm showing you now is, you know, there's a reason why why I'm you know there's, but there there's must be other groups. There must be people making. Well, you know, there's even people in Intel making these things. But what I'm showing you is what, what we do at TCAT. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it does have value for experimental theorists. Oh, absolutely. It absolutely does. And so, no doubt about it. And, and, and for, at Intel, uh, I don't want to, you know, misrepresent uh, Intel. What, what, <laughs> well, that's the bottom line for, you know, any, you know things that you, we, we figure out in, 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 with TCAT, we, if, if they are of value, that, that opens the door for the experiment. But it, it, the experiment is a, a very important part of that. Can I just ask how experimentally, you know, how bad is the performance actually? Is it the, I don't think so we made this device. We haven't made no, this device. No, but if we make it just with, with silk, just silk, how bad is such a device? Oh, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah, yeah. We have made some gallium and tin and indium arsenide P-channel content, and they're pretty bad. I'm not sure these are bad data. They're all bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not necessarily because of the band issues. That could be other issues. How do you make that content? So, uh, okay, I'm going to stop this conversation. So, so, look, look. You know, I'm going to make it through about half my converse, half, half what I would like to show you. If we, we so uh, again, I'm, I'm giving you the disclaimer here. What I'm trying to show you here, I'm not, I, and I, I realize it's slippery slope. I want to show you real work that we've done because I, I, I that makes it tangible for you. But I'm not really trying to disseminate technical results to you as much. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? I'm showing you illustrations of the kinds of approaches that we take. That you can do. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really what I'm trying to do. I mean, there's the other things if you're dealing with nanocrystalline materials, which you are. I mean, once the device gets small enough, of course, you get, uh, as you know from the work at Intel, mm -hmm. that's why you get both of them, get silicon event light. Sure. Because you can get a direct band yeah. out if you have a small enough mm -hmm. crystal I'm just also wondering there. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know, but you know, so, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to move on, and I'm, I'm going to see if I can try to up-level this a little bit, because I, I think we're going to get, we're going to get caught okay. in, a, my, my point here, again, the overall point is I want to show you trends of, you know, how they've affected work at Intel, um, and, uh, you know, I, I want to, you know, again, it makes it, it you know, to, to, to come clean here, it's a lot easier for me to give a talk like this if I can stay, stay away from experimental data. And so that's why I'm trying to do that. Um, so I'm going to give you an example, actually, of uh, using atomistic simulation, uh, in particular DFT, to solve a technology problem, or to investigate a technology problem. In this case, what we're doing is we're, we're trying to select a, a liner layer. And the liners that we're interested in are actually the liner layers that go around these interconnects. This is an interconnect stack cut right through the product. So most of these interconnects, they have a lot of copper in them. And one of the problems with copper in the manufacturing process is it, it's aggressive. It tends to move. It, it will short out your device with subsequent, uh, short out your, your interconnects with subsequent uh, processing. So what you're trying to do, well, what you need to do is you need to first put down a barrier layer, and the barrier layer has to have two important properties. One property is it has to act as a barrier layer to keep copper where it needs to be. The second property is uh, copper has to de uh, deposit uniformly on it. Otherwise, you will have voids. So we're going to look at one of these properties, the uniform def uh, deposition property of different barrier layers um, for this particular study. And we're going to do that using this functional theory, which we heard about er earlier from Professor Go. Essentially, you're solving Schrodinger's equation again, but you're solving a, a much more general Schrodinger's equation, uh, and you're making uh, far less restrictions on, on how you're treating the electronic wave functions. The bottom line here is that with this ab initio technique, you can actually get the resulting electronic structure and material parameters using a very fundamental method. 
You don't have to worry about type binding bits and things like that. And so the uh, the uh, good example of tool here is, is VAT. So what you're looking for uh, in terms of uh, uh, uniform deposition is you, is you want the copper to wet the surface of whatever candidate barrier layer you're interested in. So it's going to look something like this. It's going to be more uniform. You want, you want a uniform coverage. If the copper doesn't wet the surface, well, then it looks like this. It looks more like you have agglomeration. looks more like beating. So what we're going to look at is we're going to use DFT to look at a number of candidate barrier layer chemistries and see which one of these is going to actually have uh, more uniform, might give us more uniform coverage versus less uniform coverage. And the quantity that we're going to compute is this surface affinity. And we're going to use that with, with DFT. So these are the candidate materials. We computed the surface uh, affinity of, of each of them with DFT. And just looking at this, you would say, well, you know, uh, the, the, the one with the highest surface affinity, that's the material you should use. It looks like it should be tantalum. So how well does this compare with the experiment? So I do show some experiment here. So I made sure that I, I quickly reverse myself for this. Um, I was counting out there not being too many material scientists here, but uh, I know there's a lot. So maybe, maybe this, this, this won't work either. So if you look at something like uh, titanium nitride, which we say has low surface affinity, uh, and they, you run the experiment, and it, it really does. There's a lot of beating that's occurring here. Uh, titanium nitride's uh, silicide, there's less beating, but still not getting uniform, as uniform as you'd like. Same is true with this tantalum nitride. Well, it turns out when you use tantalum in a certain crystallographic direction, you actually get a lot of uh, uniform def uh, deposition. So techniques like this are, are going to be, you know, they're important now, and I think they're going to even become more important in the future to help select the uh, help select the materials uh, that uh, that you need for processing. And the reason is is something like this. You may have seen something like this before. That in 1980s, if you look at the processing, uh, involved something like 12 different elements, 10 to 12 different elements. In the 90s, we added a few more, but now there are over 40 different elements, and who knows how many alloys involved with silicon processing. Being able to uh, prevent factorial experiments running on these kinds of uh, combinations, it's, it's, it's a huge money saver. And DFT can do that for us. OK, so next I want to talk about uh, in what we're doing in terms of capturing imperfection. I'm going to go through a, uh, at least a couple of these uh, quickly so I can make sure that I stay somewhat within my time, time slot. I'm not trying to, hey, you know, one thing. If you have questions, I'm not trying to keep you guys from, from answering. Uh, I'm just, I just may not give you the answers uh, that, that, that you'd like. So the reason why we, you know, capturing imperfection is, is, is so important is, is this Zen-like statement. When everything is small, everything is big. So what does that mean? Well, obviously, if you have a defect in a large device, it plays a much smaller role than that same defect in a very small device. So the bottom line is that when, when we're approaching 10 nanometers, you know, idealizations no longer become sufficient. Because what happens is that device design must be both variation and defect aware. It's no longer just sufficient to compare and uh, the intrinsic operation of the ideal, of the ideal devices at the next technology node. You actually have to look at their vulnerability to variation and defects. So here I'm going to show you a, a, an example of, uh, of uh, investigating this that has to do with uh, looking at the random dopant fluctuations in silicon nanowires. This is done by Roxana Belizada. It was shown by Martin Giles at the ITRS workshop. I think most of us have seen something like this, where the average number of dopants is becoming a countable number as we go to uh, smaller technology nodes. Um, these dopants are, in general, randomly distributed within the device. And be they're in such a small number now, and, and the device is small enough that their exact arrangement, their exact random arrangement now, uh, affects device behavior. So what we want to do is we want to look at what is the vulnerability of a nanowire to a single um, dopant atom in the channel. So this is the system we're looking at. It's a silicon nanowire, square nanowire, uh, three nanometers on an edge, on each edge. We're going to use NEGF to simulate this, but we're going to, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to place just one dopant atom. 
you can place it at different places in the wire. This is what the, uh, the uh, potential that arises, the potential well that arises from that open atom looks like. You see it's a very dramatic effect with, on the uh, overall potential profile. Here is the results when we put a single dopant atom in the, in the middle of the cross section, but we move it from source to drain. Now, I'm going to show you this in better resolution in a minute, but the uh, way you can see overall, the big effect that it has is in the subthreshold region. It's going to change the, uh, the VT of the, of the device. It's going to change it reasonably dramatically. So if we look at the device and we put the random dopant near the source, we see about a 50 millivolt change in v VT. It increases 50 millivolts. If we put it a little bit more into the channel, it actually has a bigger effect on the barrier. And there's a, a, a little bit larger effect on, on the um, overall uh, uh, VT. As we move it to the drain, it becomes less of an issue. We're going to do the same thing, except instead of moving the uh, dopant from source to drain, we're just going to keep it in the middle of the channel, but we're going to move it along the cross section. What I'm showing here is uh, how the electron density uh, compensates for having a, a, a dopant right in the middle and as we move it to the side. And as you might guess from these pictures, obviously having the dopant in the middle of the channel is going to have a bigger effect on VT, and that's what we see. And as you move it more to the edge, it has less of an effect, but it still has, a, it has an effect. So, I mean, obviously, things like this are going to be a, a, a serious concern when you go to nanowires of this dimension. Because, remember, you need to make this device, you know, a billion times, literally a billion times across your, across your product. Okay, so that's an example of, you know, a, a defect that, that, that you would actually uh, like to not have to worry about. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, that this work is a, it's a couple years old now, but I'm going to show you a, a defect that you, you actually want to exploit and accentuate. And this, these are edge dislocations. But I think this is one, uh, one source of strain that I, I don't think Connell covered, but I want to, I want to, talk about it. So where do these things come from? I'll tell you where they come from and I'll tell you what they are. So when you implant the source drain region and you epitaxially regrow these regions, if you do it uh, under the right anneal conditions and the certain orientation of the wafer, you will see defects that will form like this in the source and drain. These defects are edge defects and what they are essentially is a missing plane of atoms. Now these atoms don't just sit there they actually move into that space. And when they move in, they pull atoms with them above the defect, and that puts a tensile stress on the lattice above the defect. But below the defect, since the, uh, the lattice is kind of curving around the defect, you're, you're pushing atoms out, you get a compressive effect. So if you were to actually simulate the, um, uh, the overall prof uh, stress profile in the device, uh, we did, you can do that with something like flukes. Here we're explicitly putting this defect in there. We did not simulate the creation of the defect. But you can simulate, uh, you can put the defect in there and you can actually simulate the, the overall effect of different process steps on that, on the stress fields emanating from that defect. You, you'll get a, uh, you can get a uh, profile that looks something like this. Here I'm just looking at near the gate re contact region. This is um, tensile stress, this is compressive stress. If you take a slice right across the middle here, or excuse me, uh, close to the surface, what you can see is a pretty healthy amount of stress. It's going from about 200 megapascals to about 700 megapascals. And again, what does stress do? It moves the positions of the atoms. When you're moving the positions of the atoms closer, or pulling them far, farther apart, in this case, pulling them far apart, you are changing the band structure, and it just so happens you change the band structure in a way that allows electrons to move a little bit more quickly through it. So you, so you end up getting a, a mobility enhancement, and hence a, uh, a, a on-current enhancement. Now the neat thing about doing this with, 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 with a, a, a simulator like Flutes is you can simulate then the effect of subsequent proper process steps on the, the uh, stress fields that emanate from this defect. And so what we did was, uh, and this was mentioned uh, today, and it was, uh, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned earlier in this conference, but we looked at the effect of a gate first and a gate last process on the stress that emanates from these edge dislocations. So let me just explain a little bit the difference here. So in the gate first process, it's, it's kind of what you think about in terms of traditional uh, silicon processing. You put down your gate, you implant, and then you uh, epitaxially regrow those layers, and you anneal. 
uh, you're kneeling while you're doing that. In the gate last process, you put down a dummy gate, you implant, you take that gate away, then you regrow. Then you put your gate back. Now what happens is, in that interim, when you're actually regrowing, and you're causing that uh, defect to uh, appear, you actually allow uh, that defect to have a, a bigger overall effect of, on the uh, atoms in the channel because there's no gate above it holding those atoms in place. So it actually pull, it's able to pull a little bit harder on those atoms in the channel. It gives you a little bit more stress. And that's what you're seeing. It's, you know, it's not a huge amount, but it gives you a little bit more stress. But that actually ends up giving you, it can give you quite a bit more performance depending upon where, in the, you know, uh, how much you're, been, you're, you're skewing the band structure at, at that particular stress point. So it turns out that for NMOS, this is a, this is a, a big deal. It gives you 10% more performance. Um, I'm going to go really quickly through, through this because I want to make sure that I get to my last uh, segment. Um, but I, I, I want to show you, uh, I mean, ideally what you'd like to do is you don't want to just posit that there's a, there's a uh, defect there. You'd like to actually simulate the genesis of the defect with, with processing and all the way through electrical performance. So the way that you would have to simulate the creation of this defect is, is, is not with something like this. You actually have to go more fundamental. You have to use something like molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics, you start out with the positions and velocities of the different uh, uh, atoms in the system. You calculate the forces between them. Then you solve Newton's equation of motion for a small time step. And you iterate that process until you, uh, for as long as you like, or until you reach steady state. And so what you want to use, I mean, the physics here is, is so it's all classical mechanics, but there's a lot of physics that, that could be actually more, more uh, sophisticated than that. It goes into these interatomic potentials that you put into this. And that's really the key to get these potentials right, these force fields. But once you get out of it is you're able to calculate the structure of mechanical properties. An example of, of, uh, of a uh, tech, uh, tool that does this is lamps. So I'll just show you some, some, quickly show you some results here. This is kind of a boring case, but it's, it shows you that it works. What we're doing is we're growing silicon epitaxially on relaxed silicon. So the silicon self-assembles into a perfect lattice. Nothing very interesting happening here. If we do the same kind of simulation where the underlying wafer is strained, now this, this epitaxial silicon is being forced into a smaller lattice constant. What happens is, as you're growing this epitaxial silicon, um, the uh, strain energy in the silicon builds up to a point where it can actually overwhelm the forces that are, are trying to keep it in that compressed lattice spacing, and you'll, you'll have a defect appear that relieves the, the, the stress. And that defect is a little bit small here, but it's basically a dislocation where you have a, a silicon bond breaks and it allows the silicon to go back to the lattice, uh, 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 it's more natural lattice constant. And you can imagine if you, if you do this on a, on a even more, more strained silicon wafer, you're going to start seeing defects appear earlier in the, in the resulting lattice because there's just a lot more strain energy to oppose the forces that are, are, are trying to maintain the lattice, the strain lattice constant. Here's a more, a uh, little bit more uh, Extensive example where we're growing germanium on top of silicon. There's actually a defect here. Can anybody name it? See it? Yeah. Obviously you can't. You can't even see it even, even if it's in front, front of you on the computer. But if, if you look really closely and start tracing out the atoms, you can actually see where you, that same kind of defect I'm talking about, you see two planes of atoms going to one plane with a, with a dislocation defect there, all because the germanium uh, lattice constant is larger than silicon. So there's a defect appears. Yes? What kind of force field is this? Oh, what, uh, you know, I actually don't know for this particular si uh, simulation. For the, for the nano relay that I'll show you, we were using reacts. Okay. But not, not from, for this from one, from I don't. Bill Gardner's group. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, for this one, I don't know. That's a, that's a great question, though, because that's the key to getting these things right. You have to use the right force field. Obviously, the force field that you put in there is going to. Uh, determine the overall result. But the, the point here is, you know, this is just, uh, you know, we're the nascent part of developing these kind of methodologies. What we would like to do again is to be able to simulate the process while 
actually see the de uh, defects appear and then take them all the way to their electrical con consequences. Right now, those two, two things are, are, are disconnected, those two simulations. So next, uh, for my final uh, uh, topic I want to cover, I, I'm calling it bridging the gaps in the two uh, areas that I, I want to make sure to, to uh, emphasize are the importance of classical models in, in uh, process development, and then I want to talk a little bit about how we're trying to improve them, and why it's so important for us to, to uh, renovate them. So to, to really motivate this, I want to talk a little bit, I want to step back a little, little bit and just talk about uh, kind of our, 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 our usage of these two different kinds of tools. So what I'm going to show you is the, the frequency with which we use, we conduct classical studies, or studies based upon classical tools, versus the frequency with which we conduct studies based upon atomistic tools. What I'm showing here on the uh, y-axis is the number of studies that we do per week. This is, this is not made up data. It's, I mean, it, obviously you can, uh, you know, I, I can't defend every, I can't defend the, the, the third decimal place of what I'm going to show you here. But I, I, asked, I asked my folks to, to estimate how much, the, oh, every year we ask, we ask them about how many studies do you do per, you know, per week. And when I talk about studies, it's not just one simulation, it's, it's multiple simulations. So you can look at this as the number of technology problems that are solved per week. And so if we look at that for the class, using classical tools, it looks something like this. And it's steadily gone up, and it goes up with the number of people that you have working in the area. There's no, you know, people don't, you know, the, the problems in general get, get tougher. It's not like, you know, one year they solve one problem and a year later they now can solve three problems. It's not like that. It pretty much uh, follows the, 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 the head count that you have in this particular area. Okay, so this is using classical tools like classical diffusion, uh, using uh, the process tools. Next, I want to show you the number of problems that we address per week using atomistic tools. So if you look at it, we didn't really start using them in earnest until 2011, and we're up to about one a week. So we do about 50 studies a year. Using atomistic tools, that's NEGF or D DFT. Can I keep more in this group? Um, so I can divide the number of studies by number. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, not everybody does the same amount. But, I mean, so uh, in this group, there's about 30 people in this group. Some of them are developers, so they're not, you know, they're, they're le but so they're less involved with this, with, with the actual application studies. But it's about 30 people. Okay. So that is the frequency of technology problems that we solve with each kind of tool. Next, I want to talk about the computational demand involved with each of these tools. So you know where this is heading. Um, if you notice, this is a log plot, and it's pretty amazing when you think about it. You can think of, if, if you want to put units here, you could be a thousand CPU hours. It, I mean, this is, you know, it's pretty, I, I didn't, you know, when I saw this data, the first thing is, you think, not to believe it, but, uh, Believe it. <laughs> so this is how the computation demand has progressed using classical tools alone, using drift diffusion and using uh, uh, flutes. And what you can see, it's increased almost three orders of magnitude. And you see a big inflection point here? Well, this is when we went to the trigate process. So we added a third dimension. Before we could get by with a bunch of 2D simulations, now we have to routinely do 3D simulations. OK, so now you know, now, now you know what's going to happen next. Uh, I'm going to show you what the atomistic demand is. It quickly, when we start using it, it, it outstripped the demand, uh, computing demand required by the classical techniques. And you can see it's, you know, even though we're solving a lot fewer technology problems, it's costing us a lot more. So if you want to break this down, make it a little bit more quantitative. Um, I'm just giving rough numbers here because it, all, it really depends upon the problem. If you look at the, the, the typical classical computation burden, if you're running your, your classical process simulator, you're running a single process flow of a trigate device and then doing the uh, IV characteristic, it takes about four, four or so hours to do the process simulation. It takes about one hour to do the drift view simulation. If you go to a semi-classical technique, molecular dynamics takes about 20 hours to uh, do one simulation. Monte Carlo actually takes about 20 days, believe it or not. <laughs> this is probably not the most optimized Monte Carlo code, I, I must admit. 
But then if you look at the um, atomistic computational burden, it's, it's incredible. I mean, this is much there actually looks like a bargain compared to MGS, which is, I, but we're not expected that actually. Now, obviously, we're not going to wait, a, you know, a year to get our NGF results. But uh, these are highly parallelizable codes. We throw lots of CPUs at them. Uh, but you, what you can tell is that it's just, it's so much more expensive to uh, solve a problem now with, with these atomistic uh, techniques that you, you, you cannot rely on them if you, be, if you really want to support technology as closely as we do at Intel. So classical simulation, simulators are still necessary. But the thing is, you have to make these simulators applicable in the regime that you're going to use them. And so I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about what we've done to patch up drift diffusion. Um, and I hope you don't lose all respect for me after you see the next few slides. But I'm, I'm going to show you what, what we've done. Because I, I think you, you, you need, I want you to know how much time we spend on things like this. And I feel like at this point, we're, we're pretty much going it alone on these kinds of things. But, but I, I could be. I could be mistaken about that. So, uh, uh, Professor Lawson gave a great introduction to drift diffusion. I don't think I need to re repeat what he said. Um, so, I'm not going to. So, these are what the equations look like. It's based on, upon a very simplified Boltzmann transport equation. These are the equations that we want to make applicable in the nanoscale regime. So, this is kind of what it <laughs> feels like. This is drift diffusion, and we, we, you know, we have to go through Herculean effort, efforts to make it applicable to our problems, but it's worth it. Uh, the two class of things that we, we've had to do to it is we have to do, add some quantum corrections, and we have to change the mobility models. These are the things that change, that become very important in the, uh, you know, as you, as you scale down technologies. Quantum effects, obviously, mobility models, because they are heavily dependent upon the band structure, and we all, we all know that the band structure changes as, as the device scale changes now. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a couple methods that we're doing to, to fix our quantum catastrophes. Uh, the first one is uh, trying to get the right quantum density. So if you just take a trigate device and you take a cut across the middle of it and you look at the potential profiles, it looks something like this. If you were to simulate the system classically with drift diffusion and Poisson, you're going to get a electron density that looks something like this where you have a pileup of these carriers at the potential boundaries. But this is inaccurate, because we know uh, this is a very particle picture of electrons. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're actually simulating waves, the waves are going to attenuate in both of these potential barriers. And you're going to actually you end up getting, if you solve Poisson's equation, uh, shorter Poisson's equation, you actually get, should get a density like this. Well, it turns out. It's not too hard to make this density look like that with a proper shape function. And Wilfred Hunch of IBM came up with this neat trick of doing that. It's basically, you, you, it's a total fake. But the thing is, there's some fitting parameters that actually allow it to be applicable for actually a wide range of uh, dimensions for trigate and also bias conditions. So I'll show you, these are very old results, but I'll show you where we're essentially doing this, this same kind of simulation. This is our classical result. The solid line is the rigorous result from solving Schrodinger Poisson's equation. And using this Hodge fit, we're able to replicate that. Now we go to a different bias. Again, we don't change any of the fitting parameters. Obviously, it'd be no good if you had to change the fitting parameters for every time you ran a simulation. You can still get a good fit. So we've been using this. Uh, you know, this isn't the most general way to approach the problem. If we go to a very difficult problem where we don't have a cal where we're not calibrated for that particular device, we have to do something different. We want, and that, that different thing that we do is this. We take the, uh, we, we, we solve the diffusion equations, then we take out the potential and Fermi level, and then we solve Schrodinger's equation exactly in slices along that channel. Then taking those exact um, quantum density uh, Results, we use a sophisticated fitting function and we put that back in Poisson's equation in drift diffusion and we iterate this process until we get a self consistent solution. Now, this is the more general way of handling this. If you're going to do a fake, this is, this is the fake that you'd like to do, but it takes about 10 times as much computation to do this. Now, one thing that makes coming up with it, uh, this is a nifty little solution, uh, even though, you know, I'm I, I sure all the physicists are wrinkling their foreheads here, 
But um, one thing that makes this easy to do from a practical standpoint is that we have a very modular architecture to our device equations such that we can mix and match solution methods without having to come up with a whole new code. code. And the way we do that is we, we have this modular device simulation framework. Within our core, we have uh, three different kind, uh, three or four different kinds of uh, equations that we solve. We have the diffusion equation, we have Poisson's equation, of course, we have Schrodinger Poisson, we have NEGF, and we can hook these up in a variety of ways to, to cobble solutions like this. Um, we've already talked about how important it is to capture tunneling current. Uh, I want to show you how we do this in, our, in a drift diffusion context. Um, drift diffusion already handles the, the thermionic part of it. Uh, does not handle the, the, the tunneling part of it, and that tunneling part is becoming a huge deal when you go below 10 nanometers. There's actually more tunneling current than there's the thermionic current through the barrier. So we all know this is very important. Let me show you a neat approach that Saeed came up with. Start out with the structure. You use Omen to compute the band structure. Then you extract out just a, a 1D version of that. Now you're ready to solve your problem. You go through this MBS modular device simulator, you solve drift diffusion equation, then you use this estimator that, that traces the, 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 the likely paths of, uh, figures out the likely paths of leakage from the source uh, into the body or into the drain, and then you solve NEGF along those paths using this 1D band structure, and you put that result back into as a source term into drift diffusion, and you iterate this until you get a self consistent result. There we go. And how, you know, so how well does it work? Well, actually, it ends up working pretty well. Here we're simulating tunnel FETs using drift diffusion, and we're able to actually match Omen results, which is an NEGF simulator for two different material systems, um, you know, very small devices. Now, what do we do? I mean, you know, obviously we're cheating some, right? Because we're using Omen to compute the band structure. But it's still a lot more efficient to have Omen compute the band structure than to do and do this method than it is to have Omen solve the the, uh, the whole problem directly. I want to talk a little bit about mobility. Okay, uh, Professor Lunch will cover this very well. Um, mobility is essentially is uh, describes the relationship on how the electric field affects the velocity of the carriers. Uh, the way that it's usually uh, defined is. You can think of a, a large, long semiconductor that you've got a uniformly applied field to it, and you measure the velocity through some time of flight experiment as a function of that parallel field. And what you see is the velocity, of course, increases, but then it saturates, and Professor Lunch gave a good, good description of why that, why that happens. Essentially, what's going on here is the average energy of the, the electron ensemble is increasing, you, which means you have more scattering. And so any of that extra momentum that you're adding to the electron population because of the increased field, well, it's all getting randomized by the scattering. So you don't see any velocity in one, in, in, the, in, in this direction. Doesn't mean the velocity in other directions isn't increasing, but just not in the direction that you, that you want. So if you add a gate to this, again, I'm, 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 I'm glossing over some things here, but I'm just trying to give you the essential uh, points here. If you were to add a gate to this experiment, you're going to now be accelerating these electrons toward the surface of this uh, semiconductor. It's going to experience surface scattering, and you end up getting a, a, a degradation of velocity that depends upon how, you know, the uh, the uh, magnitude of this field. Obviously, these curves very much depend upon the band structure of the of the material. But for a long time, you're I mean, even now we're dealing with silicon, and we were dealing with silicon and in pretty, you know, pretty big chunks of silicon um, in a planar architecture. So it wasn't so much of a concern. You didn't really have to worry about the band structure changing so much. So in the good old days, when you went to, to uh, model mobility, you could simply just make it a, a simple function of the parallel and perpendicular field. So we you ran your drift diffusion simulations. Um, and you could, you, you, you could basically just look at every point in the device and and look at the parallel field, the perpendicular field, and then put the mobility there. And then you, you can talk about, you, I mean, there's universal mobility. There were different approaches, but this, this approach actually worked pretty well. Okay, so that was then. So today, things are a little different. So now I'm showing you a, a device. 
uh, the trigate device, and it's oriented differently. So source is on this side, the drain is on this side. Um, this is the parallel field going from source to drain. That's still the same. And of course, when you turn the device on, you have a perpendicular field pulling carriers toward the surface, but you have more than one. So now carriers are being pulled toward different surfaces. Well, these surfaces have different crystal orientations. When there's different crystal orientation, carriers are going to be moving through a different part of the band structure. You're going to have different effect on mobility. Okay. All right, things got a little more complicated. But then, of course, you know, you start to, to, to change the dimensions of this, this fin. That changes the confinement. That's going to change. You're going to have band structure effects due to that. But then, of course, you want to add, you want to look at stress. So you add stress to that. So what happens? Well, what happens is you end up with this very complex, I don't think I even have all the variables here. I think one of them was off the screen. You, you, you end up having a mobility that is, you know, six or seven dimensions. It's just a, it's a big mess. Well, we still, we still, you know, it's just like when you clean up your, you know, your daughter or son's room. We still, we still clean up the mess every, daily. And let me show you how we do it. I'm not going to go into great detail, but I just want to have you, uh, you know, have you appreciate this. And so what we'll do is we'll do a mobility calibration over a number of different structures, stresses, orientations, mole fractions if we're adding different materials. We'll solve Schrodinger's equation uh, to get the, or type binding, uh, k dot p to get the band structure. Using that, we'll attack the scattering rate. We'll, we'll put those scattering rates uh, into the uh, relaxation time approximation, get the mobility, then use this special calibrator thing so we can, we can actually cram it into a mobility model, some kind of form of mobility model in the drift diffusion equation. But wait, there's more. Because sometimes when you go to very short devices, there's not enough scattering, and so you need to account for that. So we'll run some Monte Carlo simulations, and we'll put this ballisticity term uh, into our so we go through a lot of work, every technology, at the beginning of the technology, to kind of span the space that we're going to look at. Obviously, this is not ideal. But why do we do this? Because we have a lot of technology problems that we need to solve, and drift diffusion will handle it. They'll handle it with these tricks. And I think Professor Lundstrom uh, uh, really described well why this kind of thing works. Because the number one thing that you're looking at are really electrostatic things. And then you can, you can kind of fake everything else. And that's what we're doing. We're a bunch of fakers in the industry. <laughs> you got it out of me, and I, you know, I, I was hoping I would get to that, that point. But I should stop right now. But, uh, OK, I want to show you one more example, then I'm going to end up in, in my, my talk. OK, but my final example is, is, is now when we're, at, when we're actually using uh, molecular dynamic results, and we're using those in a finite difference simulator. Before, we were using more atomistic results where we're calculating band structures, things like that, and we're using the drift diffusion simulator. So I want to show you a little bit on the other, other side of the world, uh, the process world, uh, which tends to use NV uh, much more. So yeah, this is a uh, nano relay device. I think most of you may have seen this. You have a bunch of contacts on the surface of the, of the, of the wafer. You have this um, semiconductor cantilever channel that's suspended above it. Of course, in this configuration, you're not going to get any uh, current out of the device. But what, if you apply gate bias, you can actually pull that cantilever down. You can, you can make contact if anything ever really touches each other, other than in the quantum world. But you make, you make good enough contact here that you can actually get a lot of current. So it, it actually looks like you get the ideal characteristic. But the problem is this switching characteristic is, is you know, it's very slow to get to this point. But it looks pretty good, right? Zero current, lots of current. Okay, but there's, there's, a, there's a design problem here, a potential design problem. So you've made this you know, silicon or whatever, what have you here, actually contact the drain. So, you know, the, the problem is, can you unstick it once you contact it? And so, the, the way to look at this, maybe the reason why you stick it is going to be a problem is, I mean, obviously there's a lot of interatomic forces that make, uh, you know, uh, Make atoms want to be uh, be close to uh, close together, want to adhere to each other. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have a much of a material world if that wasn't the case. So we want to simulate the ad adhesion properties of this particular uh, device. So to do that, you know, we want to use MD. But uh, as was mentioned, a very important part of of doing uh, MD simulations accurately is to get an accurate. Um, accounting for the actual force fields between the atoms. And so what we used here was this reactive force field, which was developed 
uh, by Penn State and, and, and Caltech, um, which describes really the, uh, the uh, all the interatomic forces uh, between the, 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 the uh, particular atoms that we're interested in. So we're just simulating just the tip. We can, we can calculate this characteristic. We can distill it with this Leonard Jones potential form. And once we fit it with this, we can now forget about any simulation. And this is the most, again, you know, this is the thing you really have to get accurate. We can now just take this result and put it into a commercial simulator like Abacus and simulate the overall adhesion properties of a uh, uh, of one of these relays. I mean, doing a simulation like I'm going to show you here would take forever with NB. But you can get 90% of the value out of it by just taking the taking the, the force fields, computing the force fields with NB and then putting it into this finite element solver. So what we're simulating here is a 100 by 10 by 5 nanometer bar. What we're going to do is we're going to turn on an electric field here that's going to track the top bar to the bottom bar. We're going to, we're going to turn on the electric field for, for 3 nanoseconds. We're going to turn it off for 3 nanoseconds and see if it unsticks. So there, let's see where we're at. We're at about 2 nanoseconds. And now the field goes off. And you see there's a little bit of whiplash action. Yeah. But it, <laughs> yeah. But it unsticks. So these kind of simulations, you know, they're important if you're going to be investigating uh, mechanical systems. And you, again, you want to bridge that gap between uh, the more fundamental uh, calculation methods and the, uh, the quick one. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, yeah, Abacus will deal with 50. Yeah. Okay, summary. So our imperatives, I'm going to make it really short and sweet. Uh, our, our imperatives in the TCAD department, in terms of what I've showed you today, is really we want to improve atomistic simulation. We want it faster. We want to do a better job capturing defects and connecting to continuum models. Uh, we also spend a lot of time, time and effort extending traditional approaches. Uh, we, we want to increase these continu the action of our continuum models. And we also want to advance compact and process modeling. Uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, it, it, it's, it's very nice to see uh, uh, initiatives like NEEDS, and, and we, we heard some uh, work in, 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 in this uh, workshop on compact models. You know, compact models are extremely important. Uh, there's, you know, there was a time, uh, actually, within the past few years, that interest in them has, has decreased, interest in, in advancing them. I'm glad to see that there's renewed interest in advancing them. And the same thing is true with process modeling, conventional process modeling. That you don't see a lot of, you know, uh, Stanford or, or, or even at uh, Florida, a lot of work in, in this area. But, but these tools are extremely important for process development. Okay, so as rude as this sounds, I'm going to leave you with a Chinese curse. <laughs> Can you believe this? <laughs> Why in the world would I do this? So, um, <laughs> let me tell you. So let me give you some context here. This is uh, this uh, saying is often misquoted by Westerners as, you know, may you live in interesting times. But what I'm told, because I do not read, I do not read Chinese characters. What I'm told this this means, I, and I had many different sources uh, back me up on this. I didn't really want to insult anybody. What this says uh, is a, a better translation of, of it is, it is better to be a dog in peaceful times than it is to be a man in chaotic or war, warlike times. But I actually disagree with that. And I think most people in this room would disagree with that. I think as a scientist engineer, chaos is much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, when I joined 20 years ago, when I joined TCAT 20 years ago, there was a big gap in the kinds of problems and the kinds of tools we were using in industry and the kinds of uh, tools and problems that were being addressed in the uh, research world. Now, with Moore's Law marching us forward in the nanoscale regime, you know, that gap isn't there anymore. There, you know, the kinds of problems and the kinds of tools that the, the people work on in research are the same kinds of things that, that we do in the industry. I mean, we do some extra things too, but we're very interested in those tools. So it's a very fascinating time, I think, to be involved uh, in, with uh, semiconductor research. So if there are any students out there that are kind of on the fence about uh, whether or not to, to uh, to join us in this uh, pursuit, I, I, I hope you choose to because it's, you know, it, uh, it's, it, it's really a, a great opportunity. Thank you very much.
for this 400 week simulation. Yes. Yeah. I guess it's a Nemo. Uh, it's Nemo is scattering, Nemo is scattering yeah. but uh, uh, is the cross section, uh, as you showed, five nanometer square, or or it's a, it's a subject gigantic? Can we? Four hundred weeks sounds like a. Uh, well, that's an estimation. I don't think we've really done uh, this thing. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By your little curve. I, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. But but that is a, a structure, a nanowire structure of. A you know, that, I think that would be a nanowire structure. Right? I, I believe. I don't think it would have to be uh, you know one of our full structures. Uh, a second question yeah. is that uh, uh, you didn't touch when you talk about these liners, uh, uh, these yeah. kind of you know barrier layers. Um, is 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 electrolyte pollution uh, an important problem? For, for oh, absolutely, absolutely. Especially if you, I mean, when you get to these very, I mean, if you look at that cross section, the first couple levels of those are at the minimum almost a uh, uh, cross section. So electromigration is a concern. So, so I just want to have <coughs> some idea when you say this uh, 400 day slide. Right? Yeah, okay. So one hour, one hour, what do you mean by one hour? So one hour on a, on a single workstation? Well, that's what I'm you know, for most of these, um, I was showing you more, uh, I was trying to kind of distill it to a single work, workstation, I was as a single core. So, so, Result, so you can throw, throw multiple cores, which we do, uh, to solve these problems. So that one hour is a one hour on a workstation. Yeah, that's right. That's right. A lot of parallel processing. That's right. That's exactly right. That's right. It, it, it's in hours. You know, I, I'm roughly an hour. It's exactly right. So, so you know, typically, uh, even you know what I was showing. If, if you look back there, when I was saying 400 and 120 you know, or 20 and all that, th those will be typically also the numbers of CPUs that we throw at a given problem. So we can get it done in, in days. You know, we'll, we'll, I mean, for like an NEGF, we'll, we'll we'll throw three or three to 400 uh, cores at that. Okay. Um, so I, I guess another uh, nice point about here is that there's no conservation of chaos. Right? <laughs> so there are plenty of opportunities That's right. for, for these analyses. But if we go back to the stress memorization example yep. that you showed. So um, actually that, that was the example I showed with dark field electron holography. Okay. you can look at the strain fields that generated mm. from this location. So there's more experimental evidence for your validation okay. for, yeah. for your talk. One of the aspects we saw was that dislocations are very often dissociate. So you have the part, right, you, you get the partials that form, and yeah. therefore it's the stacking fault that you see. Yeah. And that will, whether or not that happens, and the extent to which that happens, that dictates the amount of strain that you get. Is that possible to incorporate in the models that you're that you're pursuing? Uh, you know, that's a great question, and I don't know because that would have to be, you know, uh, I would think you'd have to throw a fundamental tool at that, right? We're, 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 we're right now. We're just trying to simulate just the, the fault itself, not even the evolution of it. Right. right. And, and then once you you know go to fluke simulation, you know, uh, it never defaults, right? right. It's, it's always right. there. It's just a stress. Source that that, that changes, you know, by solving the balance equation forces, and, 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 and you can see see it evolve. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously for something like that, it's, it's it's a big deal. I mean, if you if you want to take advantage of that in the technology which which we have, you've got to be careful that you don't subsequently process it out. In fact, initially the idea was, oh my gosh, look at these horrible dislocations. Let's get rid of these things. And then we figured out later, wait a minute, we're getting some performance from them. Okay. Um, now, uh, NEGF uh, is, was is too uh, slow. So your solution was uh, you still go back to just diffusion equation, but uh, you do uh, quantum mechanical calculation on the two, 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 two dimensional plane, and you get the information out. So the our solution, in fact, uh, uh, in a way, is sort of similar. We we have yesterday I presented this uh, QM EM. In fact, we do quantum mechanical simulation, not on the plane, actually, finite regime, three-dimensional mm -hmm. regime, where it's more important. In fact, you can have many quantum mechanical regimes, and then coupled with the drift diffusion, and this, and the key is, is the uh, uh, boundary condition, so that current charge, mm -hmm. current uh, uh, potential has to be continuous. So, so this actually can be done. So, so I think that there are, should, there is a solution to this 
you know, a, 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 a problem, whereas a too slow NEGF. Yeah. I, I don't want to leave anybody with, with the wrong, but I mean, we still do NEGF sim simulations, but we try to restrict those to the, the, the you know, the problems that, that absolutely just require them, right? I mean, you're not going to throw drift diffusion at, at, at a nanowire simulation. You're just not going to do that. But for our, you know, our day-to-day -day process development, uh, we need to, you know, be able to do that uh, faster than NEGF can, can currently uh, uh, provide us with the solution. Um, last question. Oh, uh, uh, actually, uh, can you tell the... Uh, can you tell the... Uh, can you tell stories of the tree gate cross sections? I mean, the tree gate transistor cross sections the, from the TCAN perspective. The story? Yeah. Oh well, we were simulating it well before. I mean, I, I don't know how, what what, what the, I don't know exactly what you're looking for, but uh, we were we were, sim, we were simulating that device uh, two to three nodes before when it actually appeared. And so the way things go, you know, I mean, and, and this is. You know, I mean, this goes the way probably everywhere across the, the semiconductor industry. I mean, you have candidate devices, and there's a, there's actually a lot of argument on whether or not we should go to, especially something big like a trigate. Um, you know, uh, components research will uh, you know do a lot of the early experiment experimental uh, work on it. I mean, we'll never, you know, we won't make a decision like that without some experimental evidence. But you, the problem is you cannot. I mean, the process isn't um, optimized for that node where you want to insert it. So you're going to have to do some extrapolation. So you, so you have, in general, you, you, you'll, you'll do TCAT simulation. You'll do uh, experimental simulation at a, at a larger node to, to show that, yes, we can actually make something like this. But, and, but, but then, but then with, with TCAT simulation, you extrapolate it to the insertion node. And if you believe the TCAT simulation, uh, which we've had some very good partners, including Suman, who, when he worked at in, in, Intel, was on the experimental side. Um, you know, uh, you, you'll eventually, it, it, it's always a process. You have components uh, research, you have TCAD people, all kind of working more on the theoretical, strategic side, and then you've got to turn around and you've got to convince your TD people this is the way to go. So there's a lot of work that you do uh, both experimentally and TCAD wise to kind of warm up your integration engineer for this huge process change. And so these kinds of things, you know, the, uh, the decision I think was made fairly quickly in Intel, but there was a lot, when, when, when it came down to it, but there was a lot of pre-work, there was years of pre-work before we actually uh, I, I actually made the decision to go with the try again. Okay, so I think we should stop here and uh, more questions you can ask during the lunchtime. So let's start our speaker again.